Hi, welcome back. So we're looking at a response to Jean Hippolyte's commentary on Freud's Verneinung. So we previously discussed Lacan's introduction to Hippolyte's commentary. We haven't looked at Hippolyte's commentary, though it is in the back of the book, Ikri, as an appendix that you can read yourself. And nor have we spent much time talking about the Freud essay in question from 1925, Verneinung. On negation is the translation of that from the German, negation. And so there's a cluster of terms here, one of which is negation that has to be sorted out. Another term here is Beyahung, which is in German. It means affirmation. And what Lacan is here referring to is a kind of primitive, mythical almost affirmation presupposed by any negation of um, symbolicity, of language use. We'll unpack that here in a little while. Another term to have in mind here is repression. Repression is not the same thing as negation, so we'll have to understand the difference there. And then another biggie on the table is um, foreclosure or verwerfung, which also comes up in this essay. Um, these are all German terms, all four of these, um, that Lacan is making a lot out of in ways that Freud did not so much. But Verneinung, negation, Freud did make something of. So let's see what we can think about with this term. It's a short little essay from 1925 that Freud writes. Um, it begins with an interesting example that kind of captures the essence of what's up with negation. Someone sits down and tells you about a dream. And you might ask them, well, what's this dream about? And who was that woman in the dream? And the person might respond, well, it certainly was not my mother. And Freud is going to respond and say, aha, if he were there in that conversation. Your mother came to mind. There was an association that you had there. You affirmed that association, and then you negated it. But it's not about her. You can think of this also in terms of... Um, this double gesture where you affirm something only to negate it when you're telling yourself or another person about who you are. I'm not the kind of person. Or expressions like, that's not me. In order for you to say, that's not me, you usually have to have in mind some sort of a behavior that you think somebody else might associate with you. So lying, honesty, you might get caught in a lie, and in part of your apology, you might say, you know what, I'm sorry I told that lie. That's not who I am. I'm not the kind of person who lies. Here you are negating the very act that you're guilty of. You're negating something that in order to negate, you have to first affirm. And so, beyahung is this term that captures this primitive affirmation that, presupposed, that is presupposed by any negation. Because in order for you to say what you're not, you first have to identify what that thing is. So I'm not a liar, which presupposes an affirmation of lying, of the possibility that you might think I'm a liar, that we both understand what lying means, that you are going to recognize that what I'm doing here is speaking a language to you. That's the most basic affirmation which we'll come to. So the idea here is that negation precedes conditions and makes possible <clears throat> any sort of, um, uh, of denial, any sort of activity. But here's the thing. In order to negate something, you have to first have acknowledged or affirmed its existence. So there's a primitive affirmation that goes into every negation. Now, in fact, if you were going to like sketch these out in terms of order, logical order, you'd have first this primitive affirmation, an acknowledgement that language is being spoken, that we all know what the meaning of lying is. Then you might have negation, where you say, I'm not the kind of person who lies. So you have affirmation, negation. And then let's say, nevertheless, that you suspect you are, you might repress that thought about yourself. Repression would follow negation here. In order to repress an idea, to take something and shove it under water so you don't want to think about it, you don't, want to, you don't want to have it come to mind. In order for that to occur, you have to negate it. And it's to the point that Freud, even in this essay, says that the no of negation is like a certificate of origin. For example, like made in Germany. 
for repression. Every repression, every repressed signifier or image, if you dig back far enough, is going to have a negation at its start, Freud says, at its origin, made in negation. So he even goes so far, Freud, in this essay, to talk about this affirmation denial sequence as um, tracing back to oral imperatives for the infant. So to affirm would link up to the infant's impulse to eat something, something that's good to eat, to introject or bring something inside oneself, and to unify with it as a result. So if you eat food, you create a union between yourself and the thing that you just ate because you're all kind of like together as one there. That would be affirmation. And then denial, Freud says, negation traces back to seeing something that is not yummy, but instead yucky, that you take out of your mouth, that you expel, that you're not interested in, which would not link up with unification, but more with like destruction or expulsion or re not rejection, but get, yeah, rejection is kind of close here. Um, so you have these, these two imperatives to affirm and to negate, which trace back to the oral imperative to ingest or expel. And this is the work that Freud is doing in this essay. Lacan thinks it's important, so he invites his homie Jean Hippolyte to come in and give a commentary on it. Now Hippolyte is important here for reasons that we don't need to discuss much, but Hippolyte's a great commentator on the work of Hegel who was also very influential in Lacan's early career, albeit through a single figure, Alexandra Kozhev, who is a Russian immigrant giving lectures on Lacan in the, or on Hegel in the 30s that Lacan is attending. Um, so Lacan's fascinated by Hegel. It's maybe one of the most influential thinkers on his work, um, right up there with Heidegger. Um, it puts us more in the realm of, of history of philosophy here, intellectual history. Um, so we're not going to go too far into it. Uh, but he respects Hippolyte because Hippolyte is a premier Hegelian scholar. And what he brings Hippolyte in here, I suspect, is because one of the key themes in Hegel is negation. And here what Hippolyte comes up with, if you go to the appendix and you read what he does with this Freud essay on negation, is he talks about the negation of negation that would happen in one of these moments. He gets into a couple of Hegelian dialectical moves here. So we can come back and talk about that later. That's absolutely something that's interesting. Right now, though, I want to focus on the Lacan essay. The essays in which Lacan introduces and then offers commentary on what Hippolyte does. If that said, you want to go ahead and check out the Hippolyte um, essay, it is in Appendix 1, at the end of a creed, it begins on 746, makes a few interesting moves, the key of which is to integrate this German notion of Aufhebung into what he's doing with this Freud essay. And again, that expression comes up, this is what I'm not. I'm not the kind of person who... And then... Hippolyte's commentary builds on that expression. What's up with somebody saying this? Now, in analysis, really quick, you might come up against somebody who says, I'm not the kind of person who tells lies. And if you were in that conversation, let's say you were the psychoanalyst, you might respond and say, ah, yes, but... In claiming that you're not, in denying that you're the kind of person who tells lies, you suspect at some level that I might think you are. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to tell that to me. So what you could do in that moment is cause the person to say, oh, you know what, yeah, actually, I thought maybe you had heard a rumor that I was a liar or something like that. Um, and I do accept that I've always been a little nervous because, um, I don't know, like, um, you could be like, I'm very, a very good speaker. And people sometimes think that that means I might be like, you know, full of BS. And so in other words, you might accept that what you previously denied has some sort of nervous tinge about itself relative to you. In other words, you might accept 
that what you denied because you denied it might be more relevant to you than you initially admitted. Now, if what you deny is a negation, I'm not the kind of person who tells a lie. If you then accept that nevertheless the fear of being a liar or seen as one is of issue to you, Hippolyte says, you have effectively negated the early negation. So to accept what you previously denied is to deny the denial, to negate the negation. So you see, this is how he gets into some Hegelian stuff here. Almost certainly this is why Lacan brought him in to comment on this essay. That business occurs on 748 to 749. It's pretty good stuff. Um, the other key passage here in this appendix, if you're working through it, is 752, where Hippolyte traces out Beyahung and Verneinung, um, affirmation and denial, interjection and expulsion, unification and eros. It kind of breaks down into a nice little column here. And he does some pretty interesting work here to say that um, Beyahung can be substituted for unification but Verneinung follows expulsion, which is different. It's not exactly a substitute for expulsion. It follows expulsion. That work is done on page 752. We're not going to mess around with it much. The more important part for us is how Lacan responds to this essay by Hippolyte again. And that's where we'll turn to next.